You're listening to Protecting What Matters by the Ohio Department of Commerce. Commerce is Ohio's chief regulator, and we play a vital role in keeping you safe by protecting your property, your money, and some of the products you use every day. This is designed to bring awareness to important issues and help educate consumers and businesses. Join us as we chat with trusted industry experts focused on providing you with the tools you need to help you protect what matters most in your life. I always recommend that um, in addition to interviewing you know, agents, um, that you have a buyer consultation meeting with your agent to sit down and talk about like Pam said, you know, you may be approved for X, but you might not, you might only want to spend Y. Mm -hmm. So um, that you have those conversations about what your budget is, what it is that you're looking for, what your communication style is, those types of things to establish that relationship before you go out shopping. Thanks for joining us for this episode of Protecting What Matters. I'm Tom Brockman, Deputy Chief Communications Officer for the Ohio Department of Commerce, and today we'll be talking about one of the largest purchases many of us will ever make in our lifetimes. This is, of course, buying a home. If you've purchased a home, you know this isn't necessarily an easy process to navigate. So what do you need to know to make this process as smooth as possible. In the first part of today's episode, we'll discuss the process of researching and securing a mortgage. And in a little bit, we'll go deeper into the process of working with a realtor. First though, as many of us have, have found out firsthand, consumers have a wide range of options when choosing a mortgage lender. So what do you need to know about securing a mortgage and where do you even start? To help walk us through this is Pam Prude Smithers, Deputy Superintendent for the Ohio Division of Financial Institutions. Pam, thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. So every financial situation is of course different. So for those who are looking to possibly purchase a home and begin the process of securing a mortgage, what's the first step individuals should take in that process and what should they be looking for? And one of the first steps a potential buyer is going to want to do is get a copy of their credit report, which they should be able to get for free. Um, and once they take a look at that credit report, they can look and see if there are any errors that they need to correct, anything they need to be taken off of there, if it is wrong. Um, they can look for derogatory items that they're going to need to handle before they apply for a loan. Um, and getting an idea of your credit score is also going to give you an idea of what kind of rates you're eligible, what kind of loan you're eligible for, and um, amount that you're going to be eligible for. Um, so I think the next step that you're going to want to do is kind of learn all those things. You need to learn the loan types, you need to learn the loan terms, and, and loan interest rates. Um, loan types can be conventional or government, which is like an FDA loan, a USDA loan, or a VA loan. Um, there are different terms. Normally there's a 15 year or 30 year loan terms, which um, obviously there are the other terms, but those are the most uh, regularly available. Um, and then in terms of the rates, they're fixed or adjustable rates. And after you kind of get an idea of that, along with your credit score, you're going to want to start contacting lenders. And the recommendation is that you contact at least three lenders. I imagine some of the research you do ahead of time will be will prevent some headaches perhaps as you get further in the process so I can understand and appreciate why you want to do that early on. You know, one of the things I think I always think back to when I went through the process of purchasing a home you know, a natural place that I went to for advice is friends and family who've gone through the process to help me navigate that process. So what other resources should people look to for help as they begin the process and and really, how should how would someone know which lender is the right fit for them? Well, besides looking to friends and family, as you said, uh, and possibly neighbors, you can look to online recommendations. You can go to the Better Business Bureau. Uh, you can look for reviews. Uh, you can look to your trusted real estate professional. Um, there's also NMLS, which is a nationwide licensing system that can you can look through and verify that the co company that you're dealing with is licensed, which they need to be, and that the individual who is your loan originator is licensed also. Um, and you have to keep in mind that you do not have to use the preferred lender for either your real estate professional or your home builder. Uh, you need to find 
the loan officer that is best for you. And you can do that by making setting up appointments to meet with um, the people that you've narrowed it down to. Um, and when you either meet with them or talk with them, you're going to want to have available information about your income, about your assets, about the kind of down payment that you think that you're going to want to have. Um, you're going to need to find someone you're comfortable with, someone who can answer your questions and is not going to rush you through the process. Um, They're there to help you understand the process. And, and as I go through that process and I consider which lender to work with, are there any red flags that I should be looking out for? Um, yes, there are. Um, if someone is asking for large upfront fees, that can be definitely be a red flag for you. Um, bad reviews. If you're seeing a lot of online bad reviews on Better Business Bureau or other um, sites, that's another uh, red flag. And one of the things that we've seen in our office are fake websites. So we had an instance where someone set up a fake website of a real company and they had an individual potential buyer wire large amounts of money to them in advance um, and then came back two more times to have them wire additional funds. But there were some red flags from that website that someone could see. For the first was that the company, although real, the NMLS number was not the same on the website as the NMLS number on NMLS. So you can go in and compare those two numbers. Um, the second red flag from that was that the loan originator was not licensed. So if you would have gone into NMLS, you would have seen that the loan officer's name, which was very generic, like a John Smith. <laughs> so it would be hard to find, but there is additional information where you can verify and see what company they're associated with. Um, Another red flag there was the address, the location. If you do a Google map search, and in this particular case, the Google map search showed that the location was a UPS store, which is another red flag. Um, the federal government has also discussed uh, different closing uh, scams that there are where um, someone will try to divert funds from the down payment or for the closing cost to a different account. So uh, one of the things you're going to need to do is when you're discussing things, especially by email or any text like that, that you're verifying that you're talking to the loan officer that you're dealing with, your real estate professional or the settlement agent and verify the information that and they're I, asking. I imagine in all the excitement of searching for a home, it's, it's maybe you're a little more vulnerable to falling to scams because you know it's a very exciting but also over overwhelming process. So all the more reason to, to stay vigilant and, and focused on some of those red flags. Yes, that's correct. One of the questions I know a lot of people have is about the timing of, of the pre-approval process. So should someone get pre-approved for a loan before they start looking for a home? Well, um, getting pre-approval definitely puts a buyer in a good position. Um, it, it can assist with the decision of what you can afford. Um, but there are generally two types of uh, pre-approvals. There's pre-qualification which is really based on your credit score and income saying, based on this credit score, and, credit score and income, this is probably what you're going to be able to afford. Um, and then there's pre-approval, which requires additional verification, the verification that you would need to show when you're actually applying for the loan. So the pre-qualification is helpful in establishing a budget. Um, and the pre-approval is probably more valuable when you're getting close to the time when you know you're going to start making offers so that um, the the owners know that you're a serious buyer. And then it's important also to note that just because you're pre-approved for amount, that does not mean that the, that's the amount that you should get or <laughs> that you have to get. Um, you should decide that based on your own budget and spending. There are some additional steps you need to take after the fact to, to sort of formalize that process and, and, and uh, complete that process. Yes. One of the things I found out a few years ago when I refinanced my mortgage is that I received a letter in the mail and it was from a lender I'd never heard of. And it said, um, hey, we purchased your mortgage. And so if I'm being honest, it caught me off guard. I'm, I have no idea who you are. What do you mean you, you've purchased my mortgage? But as I found out after making a number of phone calls, it was actually legit. So how often does that happen? Do, how often will mortgages actually change hands like that? Well, that happens quite often now. Um, many mortgage originators do not service their own loans. As soon as they are funded, they sell those off. Um, they have the right to do that. And sometimes people will see their loan being sold several times. Um, 
the new owner must notify you, as the company did to you, that of uh, their information, their contact information. There are some other requirements that they have, and if someone is interested in seeing those, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau also has a website that shows the requirements that the mortgage servicer has to um, show the buyers once they contact you. Um, but it's also important to note that all the terms of your original mortgage loan will remain the same despite it being sold. And if you ever have any questions about whether there is any authenticity to who is contacting you, you can always contact our office or you can contact NMLS and we can help in researching that issue for you. Yeah, because I, I, when I got that letter in the mail, again, it was, on, you know, it was in an envelope I, I didn't recognize as a name. I had no idea where it came from, but it had all my information. I was like, how do you know this? And so I, I, was, I was this close uh, to the, just throwing it away or shredding it before I was like, I better look more into this. And then come to find out that it had been sold, and I had no idea that that, that happened. And it's actually been sold again since that since that <laughs> happened. So you're absolutely right; that can it can happen more than once. Uh, Pam, thanks so much for for sharing your your time and expertise with us. Uh, after the break, we're going to discuss the home buying process from the real estate perspective. We're going to talk to Daphne Hawk, superintendent of the Ohio Department of Commerce's Division of Real Estate and Professional Licensing, on how to make the most of your home buying experience and how you can access our special Home Buyer's Guide. Thanks for listening to Protecting What Matters. Cryptocurrency continues to be in the news. Stories of crypto millionaires have attracted some investors to try their hand at investing in cryptocurrencies or crypto-related investments. Our Division of Securities attorney, John Chris, reminds you that investing in cryptocurrency products can be risky. And so if you are getting involved into a cryptocurrency investment, you need to be aware that it's oftentimes not based on, the valuation is oftentimes not based on the cash flow being produced, but in reality is just being based on some appreciation of the price that you hope will happen and may not. So it, it gets back to, we want people to be aware of the risks of these investments and be aware of what they're getting themselves into before um, they get into it. For more information and tips on investing, visit com.ohio.gov. Welcome back to Protecting What Matters. I'm Tom Brockman with the Ohio Department of Commerce. And today, we're discussing the process of buying a home and what consumers need to know to make this process as smooth as possible. In the first part of the program, we discussed what consumers should keep in mind when searching for a mortgage lender. Now we're going to switch gears and highlight what consumers should know before they engage the services of a realtor. For this discussion, I'm happy to be joined by Daphne Hawk, who is the superintendent of the Ohio Department of Commerce's Division of Real Estate and Professional Licensing. Thanks for joining me, Daphne. Thank you, Tom. It's good to be here. In the last segment, we discussed tips to help consumers navigate the sometimes confu uh, confusing process of searching for a mortgage, but this is actually something that someone's realtor could potentially help them with as well. That's correct. Uh, Tom, you know, there are different types of realtors, or excuse me, there are different types of lenders, as Pam mentioned. Um, and so your realtor or your real estate licensee um, would have information, they have experience with different lenders. So you may need a lender who specializes in conventional lending, or you may uh, need someone who uh, specializes in VA loans or FHA or USDA. There are different types of loans and not all lenders do all types of loans. So you, uh, you know, would want to talk with your agent about their experience with lenders because generally they can tell you, you know, who they've had smooth transactions with and who maybe they've, they've had some stumbling blocks with. I, I'm no expert, but I am willing to bet that it's not a one size fits all uh, decision That's uh, to make there. So it's, and, and certainly uh, I, I would, I would think it'd be wise to consider the guidance of your realtor as you navigate that process. Yes. So switching gears, um, let's say that I'm ready to start the process. I, I've, I'm, uh, I've made some, I've had some conversations with potential lenders. I've done some of the, the background work that Pam had suggested, but I don't have a realtor that I, that I'm working with yet. How can I go about finding a real estate agent and what are some of the first steps that I should take to make sure that I find someone who, who is really going to help get me to where I want to be in, in, in that new home? Well, the first step you would want to take is to go to our online website and uh, verify that your agent is a uh, licensee in good standing. 
Um, what that means is, is that they're not suspended or that they're in the process of disciplinary process or something like that, and that they're active. Um, you know, surprisingly, we suspend over 100 agents a week um, because they forget to renew on time. So, um, you know, your agent may not even know that they're suspended if they're not paying attention, if it's birthday week. So um, that's that's a good place to start. But your lender, if you start with your lender first and they to get your pre-qualification, uh, your pre-approval, they may have experience with agents um, as well. So it goes both ways. Um, but I think the most important thing to consider with your agent, once you re recognize that they are verified and, and active, is um, checking things like reviews, um, knowing that they know the area in which you're looking. And um, you know, not all agents work, it used to be that all agents work their little neighborhood, but now they're kind of all over. But you want someone who knows what's going on in the area, you know, what type of development is coming and how is that gonna affect your property values and how is that going to affect traffic patterns and things like that. Um, different initiatives that might be going on with the local city council that um, that not every agent would be aware of. And I would imagine that's important because, again, you're not necessarily looking for a place just for six months. You're looking for a place for, for potentially many years. That's right. And so the, having uh, someone by your side who's knowledgeable about these various uh, pieces of information and updates, I would imagine, is, is quite valuable and something that uh, the vast majority of people going through this process would would appreciate having uh, that knowledge before they make this decision, sure. not something they learn after the fact. Right, that's right. It's a very expensive lesson if you learn after the fact. I would imagine so. And, uh, uh, so one of the things that we we talked to Pam about was referrals. Um, you know, it's it's one of those things. Of course, reviews online and on social media are always very uh, helpful. I always am, am turning to friends and loved ones who have who've maybe uh, in the same area, if they've used a realtor, I would ask them, hey, who'd you use? Was it a positive experience? Any thoughts on that? So who should, aside from friends and family, who should someone turn to for perhaps additional referrals? Um, because it's from what you're telling me, it's vitally important that I find someone that really is a good fit for me. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, you may want to start with, if you're focused on a specific area, um, in I know here in the Columbus area, there are, there are local associations. So we have the Columbus Board, but there are also you know, the Grove City Area Association, the Hilliard Area Association. Mm -hmm. Those are good places to start because you want an agent who is active and involved in their realtor community as well because they're going to be more knowledgeable they're going to be um, you know more up to date on what's going on in that area so that's a good place to start your lender is a good place to start if you uh, if you happen to start there and um, you know but back to what you said Tom I think you know friends and family are, are a good resource as well um, there's nothing better than someone who has recently, you know, utilized the services of a good agent and they have um, their own personal review, somebody that you know and trust. Um, but I also, and I've mentioned this in other episodes that we've had, um, you know, not everyone wants to work with a, a close family member or a friend. And there, there are different reasons for that. Um, sometimes people are very private. They don't want to necessarily disclose their financial situation. Um, you know, and, and so that there may be that reason. Um, but you want to make sure that it's somebody that you click with, that you feel like you have the same communication style and that um, you can be yourself and um, that they'll take the time to walk through, um, you know, the process with you. And I'd imagine at the end of the day, it's it's still really important for the consumer to know that, you know, they're the ones leading this, leading the conversation. So if they, if they're talking with a realtor, if they don't feel like there's that connection or if they have any concerns, I imagine they shouldn't be hesitant whatsoever to maybe go a different direction. They shouldn't feel like they're locked in. Yes and no. Um, we, we are at a, a, a cusp in the, in the industry right now. Um, and I can't speak to NAR lawsuits specifically, but there, there has been a settlement. And part of that settlement um, is that agents have to 
realtors, realtor members. So there's a difference. Not all realtors, um, all realtors are real estate licensees, but not all real estate licensees are realtors. Mm -hmm. So the easiest way to remember that is the Realtor Association is a club. Okay, mm -hmm. it's a membership. And so um, the individuals who are realtor members have to abide by the, the outcome of this settlement. And part of that is the, um, that agents have to get a buyer agency agreement signed before mm -hmm. they can present an offer. So that's sort of changing things right now. And, and Ohio also is looking at a, a piece of legislation to require buyer agency agreements. So to answer your question, it's an agreement, and yes, it does lock you in. However, um, if there is an issue, my recommendation is to go to the broker and ask to be released, just like you would if you were unhappy with your listing agent. So there is a way, there is a remedy. If you're not happy, they can assign you to another agent or they could release you. Uh, but I would imagine there's some initial conversations that happen before there's any kind of agreement drawn up. Yes. That you that, that you can you can make that change in those early conversations. Yes, and I always recommend that um, in addition to interviewing you know agents um, that you have a buyer consultation meeting with your agent to sit down and talk about like Pam said you know you may be approved for X but you might not you might only want to spend Y mm -hmm. so um, that you have those conversations about what your budget is what it is that you're looking for what your communication style is those types of things to establish that relationship before you go out shopping and I would imagine with for a lot of clients as they work with a realtor they have a, a their knowledge on the process varies dramatically you may have some that are very familiar and they're very uh, they're equipped with the information they need to maybe choose a lender that's a good fit for them. But I would, I would have to imagine there's probably some clients that realtors are working with that maybe just don't really know what they don't know. So uh, it, it, would that work into the equation as far as maybe the lender that a, a real estate agent might recommend? Absolutely. You know, um, I was a, a longtime licensee before I became superintendent. So I've actually been out there selling homes for 26 years. And one of the things that I took into consideration when I was uh, selecting lenders for my clients to interview was how much guidance do they need? Are they are they elderly? Are they first time home buyers? Are they perhaps even special needs? Um, do they, you know, are, because some people are, you know, they're the hurry up type, let's get her done. And then you've got the other people who are sort of like, I need every question answered. And so um, I always took that into consideration too, when selecting a lender to, um, to refer to my clients. Daphne, thank you so much for being here, but, but don't go too far because both Pam and Daphne will be with me in the next segment to share what resources are available to consumers to help make sure your home purchase goes as smoothly as possible. It's your money, come and claim it. The Ohio Department of Commerce Division of Unclaimed Funds is safeguarding nearly $4 billion in unclaimed funds. So there's a good chance you or someone you know has money waiting to be claimed. Just head over to our website, unclaimedfunds.ohio.gov, to search for your name, the name of a family member, or a loved one to see if you have an unclaimed fund. Welcome back to Protecting What Matters. I'm Tom Brockman with the Ohio Department of Commerce, and today we're discussing the process of buying a home, including how to find the right mortgage lender and how to find the best real estate professional for your needs. I'm joined once again by Pam Prude Smithers, Deputy Superintendent for the Ohio Division of Financial Institutions, and Daphne Hawk, Superintendent of the Division of Real Estate and Professional Licensing. Now, we've gone through a lot of information regarding both mortgages and choosing a real estate agent, but where can consumers go for more information on both of these items? That's our next topic. Pam, let's start with you. Where can people learn more about exploring and securing a mortgage? Well, we have a wealth of information on um, our Department of Commerce's website, and we specifically have a division of financial institutions, a section of that. Um, on that, we have information, and we also have links to important um, websites that I've discussed during the podcast. One is to CFPB's Home Buyers um, Manual, and then also the NMLS licensing system, so people can look up 
loan officers, loan originators, and mortgage companies. And all this information is, of course, has been vetted. This is information that people can rely on and feel comfortable using. I feel like sometimes people sort of just go on a, their popular search engine and just We'll, we'll, we'll refer to that, but this is information that is readily available to them. And that resource uh, for our listening audience is easily accessible at com.ohio.gov slash mortgage. Again, that's com.ohio.gov slash mortgage. And Daphne, turning to you, what resources would you recommend consumers review to help ensure they do everything they need to do to avoid any headaches in, in purchasing a home? We have an excellent home buyer guide resource on our website as well. And it covers everything from how to communicate with your agent, uh, how to choose the different features of your home, how to choose a lender, uh, what things to consider in budgeting for your mortgage and things like that. So it's an excellent resource available on our website as well. And I would imagine that this is probably information that people should maybe browse before they really get too deep into the process right. and, and engage a real estate professional and helping them with their efforts. Yep, that's right, Tom. And that resource, uh, similar to uh, Pam's resource, is on the Department of Commerce website at com.ohio.gov slash homebuyersguide, all one word, com.ohio.gov slash homebuyersguide. Daphne Hawk, Superintendent of the Division of Real Estate and Professional Licensing, and Pam Prude-Smithers, Deputy Superintendent of the Division of Financial Institutions. Thanks so much again for joining me and sharing this useful information that will undoubtedly help those individuals who have plans to purchase a home, maybe this year, maybe a little further down the road. And thank all of you for listening to this episode of Protecting What Matters. 